Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Jen, also known as Ed History 101, and I'm absolutely delighted to have JC with us today to talk about his book, his process, and to introduce you to a remarkable woman from American history. So JC, welcome to the podcast. Hi Jen, thanks so much for having me on. Ah, pleasure. Ed, you could please tell our listeners about your book. Well, my book is a dual biography of the man who is considered the father of gynecology, and he is um, a relatively diabolical figure. He's not a good guy, and and um, he is infamous because of a series of experiments that he performed on approximately 10 enslaved women between 1846 and 1849 in an attempt to achieve a cure and fame and glory for himself um, for a condition called vesicovaginal fistula. The cure of fistula that, that this guy Sims claimed in 1849 is, um, because Sims is the father of gynecology, is really the um, creation story of, of modern women's health. And the cure was claimed on a young woman, enslaved woman, known as Anarka. And so my book, Say Anarka, which is going to be coming out on June 6th, uh, is um, she is a, a kind of important figure in the history of medicine for what she represents. And, you know, for a long time, she had been thought to be lost to history. Her story couldn't be told. And so my book is simultaneously an attempt to, um, to chip away at the fraudulent biographical facade of the father of gynecology and also to excavate the lost story of a young heroic woman who changed history only to be forgotten by it. One of the things I thought was so remarkable about the start of your book, um, to if I could, you know, cover you in praise for a moment before we start diving into the content, is how you take time at the beginning of the book to honor the names or the names that we know of enslaved people who helped create the history or help, you know, who were present for the history. Um, what made you choose to kind of present it the way you did in your book? Like you list their names and even those who you don't have name of, you take time to acknowledge them. Did that happen as you were writing? Is it something you did at the end? How did that come about? Well, the way I told Anarka's story was simultaneously to, you know, spend a lot of time digging for an, um, you know, primary source material that documented her life. Her the, the the very first one of the first things I learned about about the story was that for 180 years, the only source on Anarka was Sims himself, and nobody trusted this guy. But he was the only evidence that she'd ever actually truly existed. So I went looking for her and I found her and I managed, you know, from plantation inventories from 1828, when close to the time she was born and then managing to recreate her entire life story with primary sources all the way through to the end of her life, her gravesite in a remote forest in Virginia. But in order to tell her story in a way that felt present and alive and human, um, I decided to call on the WPA slave narratives of the Federal Writers Project. And um, I spent a year reading all 55 volumes of those slave narratives and then drew on those details to bring a sense of presence and life to an arc story. And um, those people, those names, I wanted in the book. And the question, you know, the whole goal was to center Anarka's story, you know, that, mm -hmm. that she's a symbol in my book. She's a symbol of all the women she suffered alongside. And, um, and these, the, the slave narratives were also a kind of composite effort to record the experience of formerly enslaved persons. And so 
paying proper credit to them as well was important. You know, the book's called Sayonarka, but notably, you know, my name is not on the cover. There's no dedication. There's no acknowledgement page. The only thing that the book has by way of that is this huge block of names that appears at the front, which is all of the names of the enslaved persons whose narratives I called on to help rec recreate Anarka's story. And I wanted that to appear um, as almost a kind of Vietnam Wall style memorial to all of those people. And, you know, the epigraphs of the book are, are George Orwell, who says something like, you know, in all of history, how many names of enslaved people can you think of? I can think of two. And then the quote from protesters on Fifth Avenue in, um, in 2016, chanting, say her name, Anarka. And, you know, I really wanted to call Orwell out there, you know, because he's saying this in like 1941, you know, the WPA slave narratives had appeared before that. So yeah. I wanted to say to Orwell, you can't think of two. You've got Harriet Tubman and, and Frederick Douglass and Solomon Northrop. You've got all these names to, to think of. And probably one of the names he was thinking of was Spartacus. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to really call him out and say, you can only think of two. Well, here's 500. Because that was approximately the number of names of enslaved people who, um, whose narratives I called on to help make Anarka's story feel rich and human and alive. Now, early in your book, you describe it as a piece of speculative nonfiction. Um, I believe that's the phrase that you use. Would you mind saying more about that phrase and kind of how you arrived at that phrase? Or did you write it in a style of particular person? And kind of what, what does that concept of speculative nonfiction mean to you? Yeah, I could go on for this for two hours. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, you know, I, um, I recognized pretty early that um, you know, the, the protocols of history and biography, you know, the things that we usually say, well, this will constitute nonfiction. First off, they're different for books than they are, say, for films. You know, it's okay for a movie to be based on a true story, but, but books have, have a harder time doing that. And I'm not complaining about that, but, but recognizing that the protocols of history and biography, um, inherently favor the wealthy and the well-heeled and the people whose stories are easily recorded in the kinds of documents, meaning correspondence and, you know, papers that people have left behind, memoirs, biographies, autobiographies, you know, all of that stuff. Um, that favors people like J. Marion Sims, right? You know, and, and I was able to approach his story in a relatively traditional way. But Anarka's story just couldn't be told in that way. And, and so I, I realized pretty early on that not only was I writing a, a dual biography of two different people, it was really going to be two different kinds of history that were at work in the same volume. And, and so I think what I'm acknowledging by saying speculative nonfiction, which was actually a term that came along pretty late in the process, of thinking about what it was that I had set out to do. And others, you know, I would, I'll say others have, 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 have done things like this themselves. It's not like I'm, I, I think that I'm inventing anything here. Um, but, um, you know, in, I, th I thought a lot about, you know, a, a couple of different examples of this, you know, first off, you know, how do we prosecute crimes in this country? How do we proceed when facts are in dispute? When somebody oh. says, you robbed my store. And, and, and then the other person says, well, I didn't. And, you know, we proceed with a, with the legal system. And, and of course what happens is the police and the prosecutors gather facts, they gather evidence, and then they tell a story to a jury. They get, they create a narrative which gathers together all those facts and they tell that story to the jury. And we call juries finders of fact. And, and so that's, that's curious because of course the defense attorneys, um, you know, um, job is to poke holes in, in that story and try to make it sound like a bad story. But in another uh, precinct of human activity, we have this process that is very similar to what I did. You know, I often thought that what I was really doing was prosecuting the case against J. Marion Sims in particular. Yeah. 
And, and so I think there's, there's that as a kind of, of a comp or a comparative um, example of how, how we approach facts when they're in dispute that is relevant here. But also I thought about um, something like uh, the way that hard sciences approach these kinds of questions. You know, they're, so you take something like archaeology, for example. You know, and, and when you walk into the Natural History Museum, which is essentially the popular version of archaeology, um, you might see a giant tyrannosaur, right? Or the bones of a tyrannosaur. And, you know, you're intended to have some sense of the presence and the life of the atmosphere of that animal. And what it looks like you're looking at is a skeleton, now, if you start asking questions, you're going to realize, well, no, those are casts of bones and the real fossils are hidden somewhere in the bowels of the museum. And probably they found 13% of an animal in Mongolia and 10% in Colorado and 9% in, in Manitoba or something. And, and experts, archaeologists, will have looked at all these and they'll said, well, we think these are all the same species. And based on what we have here, this is what we think the rest of the animal would have looked like. So basically, in the hard sciences, and you can think of other examples of that kind of thing as well, astronomy leaps to mind. Um, what you have is a very robust creative process that is brought to bear on a body of fact and which is then presented to the public as this is the state of the science. This is what we know based on the evidence that we have gathered so far. There's some extrapolation away from the actual factual material, but they're not going to stop with that. They're going to say, well, what people want is they want to experience that life, that breath, that presence of that life. And so they're going to engage in a creative process to bring that tyrannosaur skeleton to life and present it. And I think, well, that was very close to what I was doing with Anarchist story. But I wasn't just... Um, wantonly inventing. Rather, I was taking that archival skeleton, the primary sources of Anarka's life, and then um, adding to that the other facts, the, all of that material from those, those, those slave narratives. So um, I thought, well, okay, that's similar to what others have done, but it was also, it was also kind of new. And, um, and, but it was necessary. It was necessary, particularly for this story, which required, um, particularly in its thornies or, or scruples testing moments, it really required you to, to feel the story, to feel the life of it. So this is a book that, although it is heavily researched, is written more in a history that reads like a novel kind of style. And, you know, I mean, I did create an, an online resource for the sources, more than 5,000 citations and 7,000 images, you know, and, and there's a whole book's worth of material there that, that includes explanations of all of, the, of all of the more narrative speculative choices that I made. And that's really, you know, kind of for, the, for the, the, those who are interested, for those, for historians, for scholars who um, are interested in the new aspects of this story that aren't found in any other work. But in terms of really feeling the story, the book itself is intended to be like going into the museum and seeing that skeleton and beholding the presence and life of these people and this time. Mm -hmm. And getting a sense of who they were. And, and I, I, skeleton is an interesting analogy because I keep thinking of the idea of fleshing out and how your book gives her flesh, gives her a corporeal form that we can we can sit right. with as, as we learn about the infamous Dr. Sims in more detail. Uh, you talked yeah, about I mean, how you had... Please. Sorry, I was I was going I was going to quickly add, you know, in astronomy they they do the same thing, you know, when they'll send a probe to say Saturn and then, you know, and then they'll send images back of the intrepid little probe shooting through the rings of Saturn. And of course, you know, we know they didn't send along a ne another little spaceship to photograph the first one, right? You know, and so we know that, but at the same time this gives us a, a chance to experience what's it like to be close to that planet. And, and in that case, that's the literal atmosphere, <laughs> you know, trying to give us a sense of the literal atmosphere of this planet. And of, and of course, you know, I think all these things are, are, are things we do to try to address the, the 
cosmological curiosity that we all have about who we are, where we came from, what is our real history, and, 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 um, uh, and recognizing that even the hard sciences will engage in robust creative processes to try to, to answer that particular hunger is, is important to remember when we start thinking about you know, history and biography, the softer sciences and how they proceed. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because we do get a lot of questions and ask historians about why historians don't use a scientific process or what makes the his, you know, historiography different than the hard science, than astronomy, you know, what makes them different. And I think what you're getting at on how we have to draw inferences and we work with the evidence that we have and to put forth theories and, and suppositions. I think one of the powerful things you've offered is that you have created a, a place where people can look at your sources and your references. So what was your process um, I know you start your book by talking about the statue and how kind of that's being sparked the the sim statue and that sparked some thinking for you. But what was your process for going through the WPA narratives and, and how did you go about accumulating those five thousand sources or three thousand sources? Yeah, I mean it was it was you know when I first heard about the story, you know I, I read, you know, and this going goes, goes back to two thousand fifteen. It's twenty twenty three now, you know, so this is a long process for me, and. You know, when when the first thing I did was was sort of seek out evidence of Anarka's life, because it was apparent that although people had been writing about Anarka for some time, um, no one had actually gone looking for her to see if any evidence could be found. And and so, you know, the first thing I did was was find that evidence. I went to um, the Montgomery County Archives in Montgomery, Alabama, and the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And, um, and I made those initial discoveries, and then I found another fragment in the women's hospital case record books in New York City. And, yeah. and so I knew that the basic claim that, that Anarcho was the first cure of J. Marion Sims, I knew that was false right away. And, um, and so I kind of got distracted at that point, though, but, but not by anything that wasn't the story, because I wound up from there writing an article about the Sims monument in New York City. You know, I, I, I reached out to Harper's Magazine. I started talking to them about the story and I wound up selling them, you know, what I called a biography of a statue. And yeah. this was well before Confederate monuments had started to come down. It was well before Sims became a kind of household figure. Um, and it turned out that there were these, you know, um, women's groups and African American groups that had been protesting the Sims Monument in Central Park for the better part of a decade and had been getting stonewalled by the city. Um, and so I wrote an article about that effort to remove the monument, and you know, and 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 then was learning more about the ongoing fistula crisis in Africa, which is was really my point of entry because it was that was learning that there was this, still this crisis that this thing that Sims had said he wanted to cure in Anarka and the others um, uh, was still a crisis in Africa. So I was researching that. I was taking in, you know, I don't know, maybe a thousand pages of of um, of of scientific papers about that effort. And, um, uh, but I was writing the Harper's article um, and then all that came out and I knew that Anarka um, could be found. Um, and I knew that her story had a trajectory, but then what happened was Charlottesville, the white nationalist march in Charlottesville, Virginia, and statues are coming down. And Harper's had been hanging on to my article for months, and I'd been telling them, look, statues. My article's about the statue. <laughs> you know, and they were like, ah, it's all going to go away. And, you know, and, and, and then it didn't. And then Charlottesville happened. And then those groups in New York that had been protesting Sims for, for decades, decade, they staged another protest. I'd attended the one in 2016, which was very small. And that's where I heard women chanting on Fifth Avenue, say her name, Anarka. But the following year, and I was actually out of the country at this point, there was another protest. And this time it went viral. Mm. And it was everywhere. And it was just enough time for Harper's to, you know, to, to um, you know, put my article into Q to, for publication and they put it on the cover and it played a small role, a kind of small kind of backup role to those groups that had been protesting that monument for, for a decade. But at the same time, that was when I went all in. That was when I went back to Montgomery for months 
And, you know, the next four, five, six months was, was a deep dive in all the places where I knew that Anarka had been. So that meant in, in Richmond, in Montgomery. Um, I went to South Carolina to research some of Sims. I, you know, I, there was some time in DC, back in New York. There was, there was um, a long time of gathering. That was, that was the real process, recognizing that there was this long, long period of gathering and then absorbing, you know, because I would just show up and find a, find a source and I would just photograph it all and then, and then put, it, put it away. And, um, and so that process of finding and absorbing um, that then became something I did at the same time that I began reading the narratives because I realized that I had a long way to go to earn the right to tell the story you know, or, to, or to even earn the right to be part of the chorus of voices that have been talking about this story because I'm not the only one who has who has written about this. There are, there are historians, there are scholars, there's journalists, there's poets, there's artists, there play, there, there's playwrights, many, many people. And, uh, and so um, my book did provide the first evidence of the actual historicity of Anarka. Um, but many people had been working to remember her in, in one way or another. And reading the narratives, um, was simultaneously the thing that gave me the tools I needed to recreate her story. But also, you know, it, it, it was something that I knew needed to be done just so that I could earn the right to be part of that chorus. And I have to say that, that it was a year, a year of reading. It was, it was the, one of the most profound reading experiences of my life. It was, you know, utterly transformative. And, and then eventually, you know, in, in another major step, um, was when I went to Africa to bear witness to the modern legacy of the Alabama fistula experiments, what Sims did. Um, and, you know, the, the, the real clinical advance that came out of that had nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with Anarka and the other named women who were part of those experiments, Lucy and Betsy, and approximately seven others. They, as teenagers, pioneered a model of care that, is today because it was a straight line of influence from from that backyard clinic where Sims performed his experiments to what's happening in Africa today, and um, to you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women who are being helped today. There are millions more who still need um, that help, but the real clinical advance of these experiments really came from Anarka and the others. And in 2018 right around the time the Sims monument was coming down in New York, finally, um, I was in Africa, uh, you know, in Nigeria and Uganda and Ethiopia. And that too was a very profound experience because it meant that this wasn't just a curious episode from history. It bore on the modern moment in a way that, that um, I thought was very, very important. Not only is there, you know, the maternal health crisis here in the U.S. and the health disparities, that means black mothers die at a much higher rate than white mothers do. Uh, there's also the discrepancy between the developed and the undeveloped world. And um, recognizing that in Africa, you know, fistula has pretty much been stamped out in the West, but in Africa, this is still a condition. And meeting so many young women who were basically an arca uh, 180, 200 years later. And that was, you know, an utterly life transformational experience for me. So this project, this is giving you a very long answer. This, this project, um, you know, was much more than just another book for me. It became much more like a life mission. Oh. And, that was, and that was part of the process, I think. It was very powerful to hear you use the phrase, earn the right. And I think that's that's something um, that that the level of humbleness that we always like to see that's always appreciative when writing about women's history, about writing about you know childbirth and that act. Um, so thank thank you for using that phrase. That was an interesting, and thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, I mean, I think I have to. I, you know, I was writing way way outside my lived experience. You know, I mean, I think that you know, I mean, and this bit sort of bears more on on you know my initial impulse was to recognize that 
there were really two groups that were having opinions about about Sims, the Sims antagonists and the Sims apologists, essentially, kind of early on. And what I recognized was that the historians who were writing about the story often didn't understand the medicine as well as they needed to. And the physicians who were writing about it didn't understand the history as well as they needed to. And I thought, as somebody who was a total outsider, that what I needed to do was get to where I understood the history better than the doctors, and I understood the medicine better than the historians, and then, and then I would be well positioned. But there was also that other question of that this was simultaneously a book about slavery, history of slavery, and a book about the history of women's health. And as a white man, I had a lot of work to do just to earn my place in the room at all. Yeah. Kind of building off of that, um, and as historians, we often get questions where people are trying to understand the enslaver mindset. So for example, people will get questions about, is it true that, um, you know, they believe that, for example, white women never breastfed enslaved children, where we know there were pragmatic slave owners. And if uh, there was a, a white woman who was lactating. She might feed an enslaved child if that child, if she, if she was able to, and that child needed additional nutrition. It, but they, people often look for very clear, you know, boxes and, and, and a very clear sense of moral right and wrong. And so one of them is they want to know, oh, well, there must have been some good, you know, must have been some good enslavers. And one of the things they will say is, look, they took care of their enslaved women. She had this one woman had this health issue and the enslaver found a doctor to fix it. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to what we know about the decisions that were made by Anarka and the other women's enslavers. Why did they make the choice to find a doctor who could fix the issue that arose after childbirth? Um, was it, I don't think it was altruistic by any stretch of imagination, but did you get any insight into the decisions of the enslavers around putting Anarka with Sims? So, you know, let me, let me first, you know, sort of talk about the very end of Anarka's life where, where her final enslaver was a guy named Charles Mason. And Charles Mason was married to um, a woman named Mariah Jefferson Carr Randolph Mason. <laughs> and, um, and Mariah Jefferson Carr Mason makes exactly the point that you, that you just described. You know, she was in a, a, a kind of now infamous exchange with the abolitionist Lydia Mariah Child. And, and I talk about this in the, in the book. And, um, and, you know, she says exactly what you said, that she, they treat their enslaved people so well, on and on and on. And so that's very real. And, um, you know, I did find the Westcott descendants. So, so Anarka came from the Westcott plantation in Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama. And, um, and so one of the first things I did was go to the Westcott, the Westcott plantation inventories in Montgomery. And that was where I first found her. Um, but there are, there are descendants of the Westcott family living today. And, um, and they didn't know a whole lot, but they knew some things. And one of the things that they tended to believe was that Anarka was taken to Sims because they really liked her, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, this, this idea of good slave owners and bad slave owners is, is, um, it's almost a little funny cause it's, cause it's, 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 it's like, it's, it's like, you know, the, the different degrees of murder, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, there's first degree murder and second degree murder and third degree murder, but they're all murderers, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so it's, so it's, I, I think it's, 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 it's wrong to try to draw those distinctions at the same time. You know, I mean, there, there, there's a, a famous story that I repeat, or not a famous story, but it's a story I repeated about a guy in Virginia. Um, this came from the slave narratives who invented a machine to whip his enslaved people for him. Um, and it's certainly the case that not all enslavers were doing that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's really a useful um, endeavor to try to figure out who were the good ones and who were the bad ones, right? You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not really important. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really notable in, in terms of the last part of your question. You know, um, one of the newer things that, that I really uncover in the book is Sim's relationship with Josiah Knott. And Josiah Knott was a mobile physician who was a doctor, but he was really more famous as a racial theorist in his lifetime. 
And it's not really well known, you know, but, but Sims idolized this guy when they were young. He knew him for his whole life. And, and then after the Civil War, when Knott was a very broken man, he actually came to Sims Hospital in New York City. Sims had left Alabama and opened a hospital in New York City called Woman's Hospital in 1855. And Josiah Knott worked there alongside Sims for, for a time. So Josiah Knott was a very important figure in Sims' life, and he was the author of Types of Mankind, which is basically the founding book of what we now call scientific racism. Um, and, and he was an absolute believer in the supremacy of the white race and was, was making all these arguments about, um, uh, oh, I forget the term, but the idea that, that there, um, there couldn't have been one Adam and Eve. There had to be more than one Adam and Eve and was, and was making the argument that, that science, because he was a scientist, that science was a better revealer of the, of the divine mind than even the Bible was. But of course he, his version of science was all about racism and proving the superiority of the white race. And to get back to your question, Josiah Knott addressed this very thing at one point. And, and he said very bluntly that enslavers only cared about the health of their enslaved people because of money, because of the value they represented. That was it. And, and that very frank announcement from a guy who was an authority uh, at the time, I think carries a lot of weight and, and, and really ought to countermand any argument that um, enslaved people were trying to get care for their slaves because they cared about them. You know, and, and particularly in the case of Sims, because this has been said about him, he's been called a savior of women and, and his motives in curing Anarka and the others or attempting to achieve a cure in Anarka and the others was all about altruism. No, these women were breeders. He was trying to get them to where they could go back to their plantations and produce more slaves, to produce more enslaved people. Because at this point in the 1830s, you know, this, this slave trade has ended, the writing's on the wall, people are already over planting cotton, uh, and plantations need income. And what they're doing is they're producing more enslaved people and taking out mortgages. And, and so that was the goal. It was about money. It wasn't about altruism. And of course, you know, Sim's larger goal was to um, achieve a cure for this and then take it elsewhere and um, establish himself as a as a as the curer of a of a a condition that had stymied the medical world for hundreds of years, and and then he would move on to other things. You know, he didn't really care about women's health. He said he hated it, and he didn't care about fistula. He he stopped doing fistula surgeries as soon as soon as he could, and um and he moved on to other things. So that idea that either Sims or the enslavers were acting out of altruistic motives just is not supported by the record in any way. I was chuckling because I was thinking that anyone who's ever had a doctor use a speculum uh, as a part of an examination knows that Sims probably hated. (laughs) (laughs) The speculum was not designed with care and attention in mind. Uh, Right. (laughs) So I think what's interesting to hear you say is that in many ways, um, Anarka was a means to an end. Uh, for both her enslavers, for Sims, and it just, it adds a whole, just a a heartbreaking additional level of dehumanization to the experience of enslaved people. And I think what's so powerful is the fact that you start with that tombstone. I still kind of wonder how it got there. Like the fact that you start Mm -hmm. your book with that, that tombstone in the middle of nowhere and, and how it is that they were buried there. And, you know, that, the way in which you restore her humanity, the way in which you recenter her as a human being makes it for a really quite incredible read. And, you know, the gravestone kind of starts a mystery and a question as you finish the novel, as you, or excuse me, as you finished your book, that was a odd, because it reads like a novel. (laughs) Um, As you finished your manuscript, as you started to kind of wrap up um, the work to get it ready for your publisher, were there any questions left unanswered? Is there anything you wish you had been able to find out that you couldn't? Well, you know, I mean, n- n- not since then, but, you know, at the, at the time I finished the, the book, I still hadn't located descendants, you know, and, mm. and I, I knew that there was, 
you know, Anarka had children with her at the time that she died. And, um, but I hadn't pursued that. And the question of the stone itself was, is, is, is actually still a mystery. Um, I'm working now with descendants um, to get that site protected, to make sure that, that it, it, it doesn't get plowed over for a subdivision that is actually really close by at this point. And, um, um, but, you know, as I said earlier, um, the uh, final enslaver was married to a descendant of Thomas Jefferson, a great granddaughter. And um, Anarka's husband's will still exists. It's at the King George probate office in King George, Virginia. And it's signed as a witness by one of her sons, meaning that the will of Anarka's husband is signed by a great, great grandson of Thomas Jefferson. And, and so this is a large stone. It must weigh you know, and I'll say, you know, very often the, the stones of enslaved people are quite small or formerly enslaved people are quite small. There's one in Montgomery that is all but, you know, that I found that is a, a person who appears on, on lists of enslaved people right alongside Anarka. Uh, and that stone's all of about 12 inches high. Um, this one's a good two and a half feet, three feet maybe. And, and it's quite thick. It's about an inch and a half thick. It must weigh three or 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. And it is way out in the middle of a forest on some very rugged land with very steep hill, hills and creeks. And it took a great deal of effort to get it out there. And the descendants uh, didn't even know where it was. And, and so whoever put it there, that's been lost. And I would love for eventually the work that we're doing to preserve that site to result in some archaeological uh, attention that results with somebody figuring out where that stone came from. But I think what is most likely, and this is what's really fascinating, is that it may well be that descendant of Thomas Jefferson, who went on to be a circuit court judge. Um, It may well be that that's the guy who put that stone there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that is probably the, the biggest lingering mystery that I wasn't able to figure out. And so you said you're currently in conversations with people who are. Yeah, we're, 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 we're talking to them, you know, we're, we're working with the department of historic resources in Virginia, you know, to get the site surveyed and, and then, you know, the, the, the temper, the, the, the near term goal is to, is to just make sure that it's it's officially recognized and protected. But the long term goal would be to get maybe a roadside marker and and, and maybe you know if, if there's there's money for infrastructure or whatever to build a path you know out out to that actual site and to make sure that it's that it's protected. Because right now you know it's like every time I go out there, I've been out there about half a dozen times. Um, every time I go out there, I just heave a sigh of relief that the stone's still there. Yeah, and so- uh, yeah, and but but there'd nothing be stopping kids from riding over it with motocross bikes or something, and you know, and that's just heartbreaking. So I would love for there to be some infrastructure work, um, but that's thinking sometime down the road. I I I believe for for right now, let's just get it protected. Yeah, I feel compelled to knock on wood. <laughs> yes. let's, let's, hopefully that will happen. Uh, you right. shared that you uh, created a website. Well, what's the URL or where can people go to see your your resources and the research that you did? So the web the website is just anarcharchive.com um, and the title of the book works as well say anarcha.com and anarcha is spelled a n a r c h a also th- there's a youtube channel that has the same uh, name anarcha archive so if you just go to youtube and search for that you'll find it right away um, or just go to the website and the website also has links to the youtube channel Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share about the book or your book writing process? Oh uh, gosh, there's, there's so many things over time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I think you know the whole goal was to 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 really center her story, you know, because she um, represents so much. You know, um, she was this sort of Henrietta Lacks kind of figure, but it was going so much further back into the past to recognize um, not only her, but also, 
you know, what she represented, because there were so many other women enslaved and no, who were also experimented on in the same way. Mm-hmm. And, and so I hope that, that, you know, one of the things this, this maybe, you know, speaks directly to your audience and the purpose of the show is, is something that I found in, in speaking to various organizations that were either implicated or interested in this history. And I'm thinking of the New York Academy of Medicine, the Medical Association of the State of Alabama, um, even the American Medical Association. And I'm going to be going to the AMA to speak to their House of Delegates early next month because um, they're engaging in this much to be lauded truth and reconciliation process, which is really wonderful. Um, but almost invariably with these organizations, what I've found is that his- history gets short shrift. You know, that that there's a, there's a funny story about the New York Academy of Medicine, which, um, you know, Sims was a member, delivered a very important um, uh, um, lecture there that established his career. Um, they had the statue immediately across from their building, um, and when I first spoke with them, they were denying any association at all, which was completely false. <laughs> and they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there was a moment when, when they actually, I was leaked a set of internal emails about their process of, th- of thinking about this at one point. And, um, and the, the president of the New York Academy of Medicine, a physician herself, she worried she said she was worried that we were getting down to a that that their process was getting down to a CSI level of scrutiny on Sims, as though that would be a bad thing, right? <laughs> as though taking a deep history or deep interest in history would be a bad thing. And then what yeah. they did was is they hired a um, an intern to go and research it, and she came back and she explained via email to this group that she had spent almost all of Wednesday afternoon at the library. That was a deep dive. Oh, twice the <laughs> afternoon, my word. Yeah, yes, exactly. And and so, you know, um I th- I think that that maybe another thing to recognize is 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 that particularly with these difficult histories, there is a um what they do is they task us. They task us to bearing witness to not only the horrors but also to to taking that deep look. And I think that way too often when it comes to a history like this, we just settle. We settle for, oh, that story can't be told. That story's lost. It can't be found. We get addicted to ancestry because we think everything on ancestry.com is, 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 is all there is. And it's, it's not, you know, and you get out into the world and you realize there's, that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I hope that finding an ARCA, um, and being able to tell her story, finding a way to tell her story, shows that um, all of these lost histories can be found, right? That, that you just have to have an unflinching um, commitment to, to finding the truth. And because it is still out there, which makes me sound a little X Files, but <laughs> you know, but uh, but the truth is out there. <laughs> so, so that was that. That is, and that and that really speaks to one of, one of my animating, um, one of the things that animated me to 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 pursue the story in the first place was recognizing here was this really fraudulent narrative that was standing as history, but it could be corrected. We could turn the page. Yeah, and I, your your book. In the way in which you craft the story, the way in which you bring Anarka and Sims together, the way you wrap up with the current events in, in, in Africa and the Ethiopian girls, it's just, you've taken us a step closer to that truth. And that is such a remarkable thing for us to be able to bear witness to. Um, I really enjoyed your read. Thank you so much for the conversation. Check out the archives. We'll provide a link to uh, the website when we drop the podcast. JC, thank you so, so much for your time today. Thank you. Stay tuned after the outro for a preview of the audiobook for Say Anarka by J.C. Hallman, provided to us by Macmillan Publishing. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. Early in the morning of November 13, 1833, 
three enslaved men in Talbot County, Georgia, moving north through dense woods after escaping their master, caught a glimpse of light and motion in the sky above, through a thick canopy of leaves. The men paused. Perhaps it was patrollers. Not by chance. It was a very dark night, and the men had been reckoning their passage north by feeling for moss on the trunks of trees. At first, the movement was only a few bright wisps streaking silently through the element. The men continued north for several hours. By then, the heavens seemed to have ripped open, and the stars and the planets were leaking down to earth like pitch from a torch. How could they not have taken it for a sign? Stars told of weather. They told of when to plant corn and cotton. And though surely there was a star strung for each of us on a silver thread, to dream of stars was bad luck, and even a single falling star signaled death. Now, hundreds of sprangles peppered the ground like hail, lighting half the world like the sparkles of a million firebugs. The hissing started up, or reports like that of a child's pop gun. And sometimes there came much larger explosions, as fireballs nearly as wide as the moon burst in great flashes overhead and left behind fearsome streaks of prismatic light. It was beautiful and awful. On Sundays, many slaves were subjected to sermons delivered by white preachers. Don't steal, obey your masters. And the vision of the stars falling thick as a mist were called snippets from Mark and Matthew about the shaking of the kingdom of heaven. The first star would fall when the third trumpet was blown, Revelation warned, and the fifth trumpet would signal the sweep of the dragon's tail, and a third of the host would be cast down from the sky. Isaiah too claimed that the end times would begin when rotted stars fell to earth, like sour leaves from a fig tree. The event was witnessed across the nascent United States. In Buchanan County, Missouri, a dance frolic in a slave cabin was interrupted by a messenger who warned that those who hoped for the mansions and the bright lights of Phelim City should say their prayers now, because the whole world was about to be crisped like cracklings. In Texas, a revival meeting had just reached the fever pitch of raining brimstone when a star shot from its place like a skyrocket, and then another came loose, and another, until the whole of the yonder zigzagged with trickles the color of fish blood. Most of those watching understood that the stars burned up in the sky, but some claimed that they burst only twelve feet from the ground, or hit barns to set fire to chaff and straw or covered fields like a sheet or like snow. In the ensuing weeks, there were reports of odd substances discovered, material like hot egg whites, lumps of soft soap, or boiled starch that evaporated when you put flame to it. It was recalled that an inflamed paste had fallen on Armenia in the year 1810, and that viscous matter had descended from the sky in India and Lusatia, in the 18th century. A soldier in Washington's army once witnessed a star fall and came upon the gelatinous mass as it was still sparkling. In the Georgia forest, one of the three escaped men fainted in fear. His companions did not leave him. They carried him back to their master, and none of them ever attempted to escape again. Thank you for listening to this clip, provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold.